anti-government protests unfold there. Iran's supreme leader is accusing the country's enemies of inciting nearly a week of protests that have left more than 20 dead. We'll have a full report on the unrest in just moments. Also tonight, rising tensions between the U.S. and Pakistan. The Trump administration tonight threatening to withhold hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid to that country for supporting terrorism. And newly released emails showing Hillary Clinton aide Huma Abedin disgraced base security protocols by sending classified passwords to her unsecured Yahoo account. President Trump now suggesting Abedin should be jailed. We're going to take it up with, take it up with Chris Farrell of Judicial Watch coming up. But first, our top story, the Trump administration ramping up pressure on Iran as the country is royal anti-government protests. Thousands have taken to the streets over the past six days to protest a dismal economy, rising inflation and unemployment, and allegations of widespread corruption. And President Trump has praised the protesters for finally acting against what he calls a brutal and corrupt regime. This news correspondent Kevin Cork is at the White House with our report. It takes great bravery for the Iranian people to use the power of their voice against their government. From the U.N. mission to the State Department. We ought to support them. To the White House. The United States supports the Iranian people. A unified front in support of the Iranian people in the throes of an uprising threatening to topple the rogue regime in Tehran. Years of mismanagement, corruption, and foreign adventurism have eroded the Iranian people's trust in their leaders. The Iranian regime spends its people's wealth on spreading militancy and terror abroad rather than ensuring prosperity at home. The White House's call to defend the Iranian people's right to self-determination is taking shape on air and online, with President Trump himself firing a cannonade of tweets that noted the uprising, his support of the Iranian people, and he accused the Obama administration of stabilizing the Tehran regime with $1.7 billion in cash in a settlement of a decades-old dispute back in 2016. All the money that President Obama foolishly gave them went into terrorism and into their pockets. The people have little food, big inflation, and no human rights. Vice President Mike Pence added, the United States of America will not repeat the shameful mistake of our past. That, a reference to a similar Iranian revolt back in 2009, sparked by the country's disputed presidential election and President Obama's wait-and-see attitude. My hope is that uh, the regime responds not with violence, uh, but with a recognition that the universal principles of peaceful expression and democracy uh, are ones that should be affirmed. Am I optimistic that that will happen? You know, uh, I take a, a wait-and-see approach. An approach seen by the current administration as grievously ineffective. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. All freedom-loving people must stand with their cause. The international community made the mistake of failing to do that in 2009. We must not make that mistake again. Strong words from the administration. By the way, David, we also learned today that U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley says that the United States will call for an emergency session at the U.N. in an effort to express support for the, for the Iranian protesters. Obviously, that is a decision that is strongly supported by the Trump White House. David? Kevin Cork, thank you very much. Well, Congress returns to work this week with a long to-do list for the new year. There is unfinished business on spending, immigration, and infrastructure. And unfortunately for Republicans, they have a smaller majority in the Senate to get it all done. Fox News Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel has our report on the big work ahead. Congress starts 2018 staring at a late night January 19th deadline to fund the government or else there could be a partial government shutdown. I certainly hope it's through the end of the fiscal year we need to get the, the funding issue solved. We've got a lot of national security requirements that need to be met and uh, we haven't been keeping up with that. A White House official tells Fox Budget Director Mick Mulvaney and White House Legislative Affairs Director Mark Short will meet with the big four leaders of Congress at the Capitol tomorrow. Ryan, Pelosi, McConnell and Schumer with a two-year budget cap expected to be a major topic. <laughs> President Trump is also pressing lawmakers to act on infrastructure, which could attract some bipartisan support. Thank you. The president tweeted today about immigration. He has set a March deadline for lawmakers to resolve it.
Democrats are doing nothing for DACA, just interested in politics. DACA activists and Hispanics will go hard against Dems, will start falling in love with Republicans and their president. We are about results. A member of the Senate GOP leadership laid out his, out his vision. That's an issue that, uh, as you know, has to be addressed. I'm hoping that we can move a freestanding bill, but when you address the DACA issue, you have to address the broader issue of illegal immigration. The House Republican whip says Congress must also work on rebuilding the health insurance private marketplace. One of the best things we did is repeal the individual mandate because that really undoes a lot of the stools of Obamacare. And now we need to go and fix the things that are broken in health care that are jacking up costs. Let's get it done. After very few signs of bipartisanship in 2017, a former aide to Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer says there could be a window for the president. He's got opportunities to do something that is bipartisan. It means that he's got to give a little bit. I think a perfect place to start is with DACA, with the immigration. He said on September 5th in a tweet, we're going to solve heart and compassion. That window is likely to be very limited with the entire House and one third of the Senate up for re-election this year. So the president's expected to plot strategy with Speaker Ryan and Leader McConnell next weekend at Camp David. David. Mike Emanuel, thank you very much. Well, President Trump is calling for another another look into the Hillary Clinton email scandal after reports that one of her top aides may have let classified information fall in the hands of Russian hackers. Meanwhile, Republicans pushing back on claims a Trump campaign aide's loose talk sparked the Russia investigation. Fox News chief intelligence correspondent Catherine Herridge has our story. David, newly released emails show Clinton aide Huma Abedin sent security passwords for sensitive government networks to her unsecured Yahoo account. In a tweet, President Trump on Trump unloaded on Abedin, alleging she disregarded basic security, put classified passwords at risk, and he suggested she should be jailed, and once again criticized what he calls the State Justice Department, imploring officials to finally act against Abedin, former FBI Director Comey and others. At the briefing, the White House press secretary explained. Obviously, uh, the facts of that case are very disturbing, uh, and I think the president wants to make clear that he doesn't feel that anyone should be above the law. In her April 2016 FBI interview overseen by demoted agent Peter Strunk, who sent anti-Trump text messages, Abedin admitted she routinely forwarded government emails to her Yahoo account for printing. and says she didn't know whether the account was compromised, despite a warning. In a separate development, Australian media reports there is anger and frustration over leaks by U.S. officials revealing an Australian diplomat shared intelligence that may have kick-started the FBI Russia case. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, the Australian ambassador to the U.S., Joe Hockey, personally dealt with the FBI over claims the Russians had damaging information on Hillary Clinton. The New York Times first reported that campaign aide George Papadopoulos, who recently pled guilty to lying to, to lying to the FBI, made the allegations in May 2016 over drinks in London with diplomat Alexander Downer. On Fox, a senior House Republican said the report is a distraction from the faulty Trump dossier funded by Democrats. Clearly, people are trying to, to say, oh, don't worry about the dossier. There were these other things. I'm not sure that the populist explanation is really any better. In fact, it's probably thinner than even the dossier. I mean, this, like Based on Fox's reporting, a mosaic of intelligence, not a single source, prompted the FBI probe. David? Catherine Herridge, thank you very much. We are coming right back with much more. Please stay with us. President Trump and the White House urging Iran to respect protests by Iranian citizens fed up with the regime's corruption. I think the ultimate end game would be that the citizens and the people of Iran are actually given basic human rights, and he'd certainly like to see them stop being a state sponsor of terror. We'll discuss the administration's response to unrest in Iran with Ed Rollins. And Senator Orrin Hatch announcing he's going to retire after more than 40 years in the Senate. His retirement opening the door for a possible run by Mitt Romney. We'll take that up and more. Stay with us. Utah Senator Orrin Hatch today announcing he will not seek re-election in 2018, choosing instead to retire from Congress at the end of his term. Hatch, who is the longest-serving Republican in Senate history, says that after 40 years in Congress, He's ready to move on with the next phase of his life. Every good fuss one to hang up the gloves. And for me, that time is uh, soon approaching. That's why, after much prayer and discussion with family and friends, I've decided to retire at the end of this term. Although I will miss serving you in the Senate, 
I look forward to spending more time with my family, especially my sweet wife, Elaine. That's nice. Joining me now, Ed Rollins, former Reagan political director and Fox business contributor. So the big question, Ed, is Mitt Romney going to replace Orange? I think there's no question he wants to, and I think there's no question he'll be a very viable candidate. Uh, I think the key question here, is he going to go be a leader of the opposition to Donald Trump, or is he going to basically be a good supporter? What do you person? think? I don't know. Romney has always wanted to be president. Uh, he doesn't never want to be senator, at least he ran for Senate in 19... 80, uh, uh, 90, 90 something, uh, and didn't, didn't make it. But my sense is his ambitions are still to be president. Uh, he's never supported Trump in the past. And I think to a certain extent, that's the question. Is he going to be a, an opposition leader inside the, the tent, or is he going right. to basically be a very good trooper and move forward? Or well, Hatch was the best trooper we had there. So He, he really came to the fore, as, uh, particularly at the end of the year on taxes, but, but he was supportive of practically everything that Donald Trump cared about in terms of his legislative agenda. But the president has something now he didn't have a year ago, which is, which is a set of accomplishments that nobody can deny, and I'm wondering if he comes to this with such political capital that even a Trump hater like Mitt Romney would not be able to exercise that hatred. Uh, I, you know, certainly the, the accomplishments are there, and I think if people would step back and move the personality aside and the, and the differences that they have and look at his record, he's had a very significant first year. Well, uh, let's, let's put up, we put together a list of accomplishments divided sort of between the, the domestic and the foreign. Domestically, tax reform has got to be the biggest uh, right at the end of the year. But the massive deregulation program in which you had 22 regulations removed for every new one is incredible. Very much had to do with the stock market going up this year. Judicial appointments, you have Neil Gorsuch on the Supremes, but then you have dozens of, of justices, conservative, pro-market, new energy policies to release all the oil and the gas. Uh, through the oil programs that we have and now in the Anwar and supporting local police. They've been decimated by all the criticisms. Before we go on to the foreign, let, let's take the foreign off for a second. I go back with that. He's, he's an extraordinary, there's, there's no conservative yeah. probably since Ronald Reagan that would have been able to accomplish all the things that he's accomplished. And he, and but even Ronald Reagan in the right, first no, year no, of no, Ronald no, no. Reagan didn't have a list like this. No, absolutely. And I, and I give him great credit for that. Uh, unfortunately, the country hasn't given him credit yet, and I think part of that's going to be he has to go out there and talk about it. His people have to go out there and talk about it, and his party has to go out there and talk about it. They should be patting him on the back, saying, job well done, because it's been job well done. You know, you and I were talking in the green room about the, the tweets and how, of course, the media loves to focus on that. And the big question is, will, will he be tweeting out in 2018, all these distractions, everything? To a certain extent, if he had come out at the beginning of January 2017 and said, I want to deregulate, 22 deregulations dereg uh, removed for every new one, I want to do judicial reform, this, that, that, and the other thing, the lobbyists would have come out of the woodwork to prevent it from happening. Instead, everybody was focused on the tweets, on something that wasn't as important as the actual instruments that he was making. Was that by design or accident? I, I, I don't know what, what it was by. It was brilliant, whatever, and it worked. I think the key thing here is the tweets have been a distraction. The personality traits of, of not being a traditional president have been a distraction uh, and have certainly revved up his enemies. But at the end of the day, he, he, this has been about promises made, promises kept. Most of these things he promised he would do in the campaign. Right. And it's not a single thing that he's backed away from and changed and altered. And that's a, a major. Now let's move to the, the international stuff, because this is thing. These are things that nobody expected. Beating back ISIS, 98 percent of it is gone now in, in Iraq and Syria. Syrian airstrikes after their WMD attacks, instead of just talking about a red line, he actually acted on it with Tomahawk missiles, putting the U.N. on notice that they can't get away with taking our money and just spitting us every chance they get, pressuring Pakistan. No president, Republican That's or right. Democrat, has done it the way he has over the past couple of days, getting NATO to pay more. And to all these, I would add Iran, supporting the Iranian protesters. And I have to go back to the Reagan administration the, the same way that Ronald Reagan supported solidarity in Poland and supported the Czech dissidents in Czechoslovakia. That led to the end of the Cold War. This is significant stuff. It's very significant. It'll be more significant as we go on. He's advocating democracy. He sees people have their own ability to choose there's form of government, and that's a very, very positive thing, as opposed to everybody else's cow tied to the Iranian terrorists and what have you in the past. And and he is actually working on. I mean, the the one thing that the the, the fake media is right about is that he is 
promoting a kind of way of looking at the world that we haven't seen in 50 years. He like is, do, again, doing what Reagan did, kind of turning upside on its head conventional wisdom about what can and cannot be done in the world. And he's doing that with the news media, with the exception of Fox and a few others that are totally opposed to him. Uh, and he doesn't, it doesn't matter. By his tweeting, by his going out to the country, he has basically gone around it and made it work. And, and I think he'll continue to do that. Ed Rollins, thank you very much. much. Great stuff. I appreciate it. Be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Do you believe it's time for a new and unbiased investigation of the Clinton team's reckless handling of classified State Department emails? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. And follow Lou on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like him on Facebook and follow him on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. On Wall Street, stocks starting 2018 in record territory. The Dow was up nearly 105 points, just shy of a record. The S&P gained 22 points and the Nasdaq jumped 103 points, both closing at brand new highs again. Volume on the big board was 3.4 billion shares. Meanwhile, Amazon said it shipped 5 billion items to prime customers in 2017 as more customers paid for the program than, than ever before. And McDonald's is testing out a new fresh beef burger in Oklahoma. The fast food chain plans to roll out fresh patties to most of its locations by mid-year. And a reminder to listen to Lou's reports three times a day, coast to coast on the Salem Radio Network. Coming up next, new calls for to investigate former Hillary Clinton aide Huma Abedin's handling of classified information from her compromised personal email. We're going to take it up with Judicial Watch's Chris, Chris Farrell straight ahead. Don't miss it. Aid to Hillary Clinton, Huma Abedin sent sensitive state emails to her personal Yahoo account, which was later hacked by foreign operators, including the Russians. A new analysis of Abedin's emails while she was at State Department shows she routinely forwarded briefings, private correspondence, even state passwords to a Yahoo address. In 2013, Yahoo was hit with a massive data breach, which the company now admits affected every email account. President Trump tweeted about the incident this morning, saying, quote, Crooked Hillary Clinton's top aide, Huma Abedin, has been accused of disregarding basic security protocols. She put classified words into the hands of foreign agents. Remember sailors? pictures on submarine jail deep state justice department must finally act also on comey and others joining me now is chris farrell director of investigations and research for judicial watch the organization which successfully filed a freedom of information act request to release those abedin emails congratulations chris uh, who knew it would lead to all this uh can the justice department now ignore all of these discoveries and and not do anything but prosecute this woman no they cannot uh, at this point there's such overwhelming evidence that really demands a de novo or a completely fresh look at this entire criminal enterprise being orchestrated by mrs clinton remember she set up that email server over which all this traffic went back and forth a week before she became Secretary of State. She did it willingly, wittingly, uh, you know, with full knowledge, intellect. Uh, this is a premeditated act on her part and her staff, to include whom Abedin, Cheryl Mills, and frankly, other senior professional State Department staff all communicated with her knowing about this outlaw server. It is so an let, let me just stop you then, Chris, because as what you were saying is it's not just an individual matter with, oh, with no, individuals like Huma Abedin and others uh, doing stuff they weren't supposed to do and putting our, our top secrets at risk. It was, as you, your words, a criminal enterprise de designed and organized by Hillary Clinton. Absolutely it was. And uh, foreknowledge, forethought, it was deliberate, it was intentional, although intent is not an element of the crime. It's just, frankly, more fuel on the fire. Also realize that Judicial Watch actually got Huma Abedin, Cheryl Mills, and five others under oath on these very same questions. And so our litigation broke, lo broke loose this story. Uh, frankly, if we had not done the work that we had done, no one would ever know about this. Yeah. No one would no, even know a, about Huma Abedin or even... I uh, cannot, Mrs. and I, I don't want to blow smoke in your direction, but I can't emphasize enough that the work you do has created just a tremendous service in unveiling stuff that was going on uh, that really put our, our, our national security at risk, unlike anything I've seen by uh, State Department personnel 
in my lifetime. But let me let me just ask you say a criminal enterprise. Would that mean that there would be some like a RICO statute that would be used to, to prosecute? Uh, well, certainly this is a conspiracy, right? This is more than one person knowingly, willingly engaging in criminal conduct. And all these people have been, you know, briefed and indoctrinated on spe uh, sensitive compartment of information and cl uh, classified material handling. They all know better. Many of them are attorneys. Uh, so they have sort of an extra duty or obligation mm -hmm. uh, for extra care in this regard. All these folks knew exactly what was going on, what they were doing. There's, there are senior State Department people currently serving President Tr Trump who had knowledge of what was going on. Oh, absolutely. On. And there are certain people that are right now in Justice Department who were, were deeply involved in not only that, but in another issue. And we don't have much time. It's yeah. such a big one. We're going to deal with it later in the show. But i got to get your opinion on it. The Trump dossier. If you're going to talk about a criminal enterprise, you put together a group of people. Let's just spell, the, spell it out for folks out there. You have Bruce Orr, yep. who he and his wife were working with Fusion GPS to spread the Trump dossier and all the lies within. Andy McCabe, uh, the deputy director of the FBI, he Correct. was involved in, in pushing the Trump dossier. Peter Strzok, of course, he talked specifically about it as a kind of an insurance policy. His girlfriend, Lisa Page, was also there. And, of course, others, James Baker. But th these were individuals who were working together to spread something that was that piece of political garbage. It was paid for to, uh, to begin with by the uh, the Hillary campaign, millions of dollars they spent yep. on it. Fusion GPS was a, is a smear merchant organization, and they knew it. The FBI knew all this, but they were pushing it anyway to prevent Trump from getting into the White House. I mean, and that is David, a criminal enterprise, is it not? It, it is, and David, here's the hook. Strzok did Huma Abedin's interview under oath. It's so that, clo that closes the loop. It, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect circle on the conspiracy. It is. And, and again, a lot of it began with your Freedom of Information Act uh, search. And, and congratulations to you on that. Thank you, uh, Chris, stay close. We've got to see where you go from here. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. We are coming right back with much more. Please stay with us. President Trump is back in the White House and ready to kick off his ambitious agenda for the new year. It includes welfare reform, also infrastructure. We need to rebuild our nation's roads and bridges and, and certainly our air traffic control system. We'll discuss what's next for year two of the Trump presidency with Molly Hemingway and Mark Simone. And then this legendary motocross biker kicking off the new year with a courageous stunt. We'll show you the jaw-dropping performance from England right here next. We'll be right back. The great... I'm David Asman, in for Lou Dobbs. Travelers entering the state of California were greeted by a set of very peculiar signs along its border freeways, reading, Welcome to California. And then the little sign underneath says, Official Sanctuary State Felons, Illegals, and MS-13. Welcome. Democrats need the votes. Now, the signs were put up as a prank, of course, and the state's transit authority has begun taking them out. California officially became a sanctuary state on Monday. Joining me now, senior editor for The Federalist, Fox Business contributor Molly Hemingway, and radio talk show host on New York's WOR, Mark Simone. Good to see you both, Molly. you got to think that we're going to get a presidential tweet on that sign. And this is just a really well done prank and it sort of drives the point home of the issue that is caused by different different ideas on immigration, whether you want to have an open immigration policy or whether you think that a nation should have a coherent immigration policy where you match who's coming into the country with the needs of, of the current population. So uh, well done to the pranksters. Well, and, and Mark, the fact is this is California. Even in California, you have people who are who, who recognize the absurdity and the danger of, of, of some of these sanctuary city moves. Well, listen, I'm absolutely serious here. This is not a funny story. This is a very important story. These signs should be everywhere. They are the truth. The new bridge should have a big sign, Waste and Fraud Bridge. The Congress should have a sign, Welcome to the Swamp, Watch Out for the Alligators. Well, nobody points out the truth of these things better than our president, right? Yeah, and every politician should be injected with, with truth serum. Put these signs everywhere. Hey, the other thing is, the real signs up there cost like 10000 a sign. Whoever did this got these signs up for about $10 a sign. Talk about waste and fraud. Yeah, and, and Molly, it also does emphasize uh, the need for immigration reform. One thing that the president wants to do, and I'm wondering if he'll get a chance to do it. Everybody's talking about DACA. I'd rather talk about something else, which is turning the, the chain migration 
system that we have in place right now into a merit-based sort of meritocracy immigration system. Do you think he'll get that done in this country in 2018? Well I think people were worried when he first made that deal with Nancy and Chuck Schumer that kind and, and he's the way he's talked about about being so open to a compromise on DACA. They just want to make sure that they get something in return for that. But these latest tweets that we've seen from the president where he explains to people that, of course, you're going to have to come up with uh, something. If, if the Republicans give you what you want on DACA, you're going to have to actually respond by by bringing forth good policies and willing, willing to work on good policies to change our immigration system, which is so random and is not working well for us. And it's not just about changing it to a merit-based system where you make sure that the people that you're bringing into the country have really good skills and right. education and language abilities that match with what you have currently. Which they, but by also, the way, they do in, in Canada and they do in Australia. Right. Uh, that Canada really radical policy that's in the, Canada. The, the, the nicest yeah. country in the world towards immigrants. So if it works for them, why not for us? It, it's, it just makes no sense yeah. how we're currently doing things. But these are very reasonable things. President Trump says he's willing to Absolutely. compromise. Time for other people, too, as well. All right, Mark, uh, let's talk about the division in the Republican Party, supposedly. I don't think it's as big <laughs> as they point out, but between those who favor infrastructure spending and those who favor entitlement reform, to which I would say you, you can do both. The president has done a lot of stuff without Congress over the past year. We talked about deregulation earlier in the show. There's a lot of waste and fraud in our entitlement programs. Just two examples. Uh, Medicare, waste and fraud is $59.7 billion every year. Medicaid, $36.3 billion every year. This according to the Government Accountability Office. If he was just sorted to expand the role of the inspectors generals to hit that waste and fraud that goes, that goes on in Medicare and Medicaid and other entitlements, uh, he could do a lot. Yeah, and you know, they talk about raising money for infrastructure. We have enough money right now to rebuild the country, ten, but we waste 90% of our infrastructure money on total waste and bloat. As you said, we do this with entitlements. Donors pay a fortune to our congressmen to make sure this happens. That's where the, that's where the skim is. That's where the Joe Pesci that's and right. Casino right. skim is and all this. And, and Molly, the, he's got such wonderful people working for him, like, like Mick Mulvaney, for example, who may not have the time. Mick Mulvaney has his hands full right now, but, but he, he could then appoint people to do things internally at various agencies and, and various entitlements that we have where all this money is being wasted, couldn't he? Well, yeah, although, unfortunately, as big as those numbers are about waste, fraud, and mismanagement, there's still nothing compared to the actual expense of the entitlements, which need reform, and which the president has said he's not too inclined to change. But one thing he could do is welfare reform. President Obama gutted the work requirements of welfare right. reform, and right. states had been trying to get out of it. He could, he could institute work requirements. That's a very popular proposal, and he could get it done. But, but you know what they say, $100 billion here, $100 billion there, eventually it adds up to real money, you know? I mean, that's... <laughs> And for all those congressmen, this is their business model. You can't tamper with it. That's right. That's right. Molly, Mark, good to see you both. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thanks. Appreciate it. And be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Do you believe it's time for a new and unbiased investigation of the Clinton team's reckless handling of classified State Department emails? Cast your vote on Twitter, at Lou Dobbs. So please roll the videotape. Watch as this BMX athlete goes flying off an overpass before riding down alongside a wall as if that wasn't hard enough, he even does it again and again and at different locations all over the UK. This is impressive stuff. Up next, protests rocking Iran as the Trump administration considers beefed up sanctions. We must not be silent. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. We're going to be talking with foreign policy expert Cliff May about whether we could be watching an Islamist regime crumble right before our eyes. The U.S. withholding $255 million in aid from Pakistan over what the Trump administration says is a failure to sufficiently fight terrorism. President Trump slamming both Pakistan and the Palestinians in a recent tweet saying, quote, not only Pakistan, and we pay billions of dollars to for nothing, but also many other countries and others. As an example, we pay the Palestinians hundreds of millions of dollars a year and get no appreciation or respect. They don't even want to negotiate a long overdue peace treaty with Israel. We have taken Jerusalem, the toughest part of the negotiation, off the table. But Israel, for that, would have had to pay more. But with the Palestinians no longer willing to talk peace, 
Why should we make any of these massive future payments to them? Joining me now, president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Mr. Cliff May. Cliff, good to see you. Uh, Palestinian, uh, well, let's talk about Pakistan first, but it's part of the same problem as the president spoke to in his tweet. We, $34 billion we've paid Pakistan since 9-11, presumably to, to get them on our side uh, in terms of terrorism, but they've been harboring these Taliban folks who run across the border in Afghanistan, kill American service people, and then run back for safe haven in Pakistan, and we've allowed them to get away with it. Why? Because Pakistan has been very good at playing us. Pakistan has been very good at playing both ends against the middle. Um, it is not in polite company. Um, you should not be saying the kinds of things that President Trump is saying, but he sees the truth and, and says it. The, you, you've got it within the Pakistan, look, it is the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, and you have people yeah. within that, that government who absolutely support at least the Taliban that attacks the Americans, if not the Taliban that attacks Pakistan, which also happens. And they're, they're two separate Taliban, but they're not entirely separate. So he's calling them out, which has not happened in a long time. And pa the Palestinians, let's face it, they're, they're a bunch of crooks uh, that run the, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, you can be, if you ever go there, you can be taken around, taken around to where they live. They live in these mansions on the hill. The poor Palestinian refugees and the, the, the people are, are living in hovels. Uh, on the ground, I would think that there would be a popular revolt against the Palestinian leadership for what they do, but we certainly shouldn't be funding the whole thing. We shouldn't be funding the whole thing when we and, and we should be insisting the Palestinians do two things. One is that they do negotiate and two, the negotiations should start, not end, with the Palestinians saying we accept the idea of a two-state solution and we accept that that means there will be a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. Up to now, they haven't said that. They said, well, we yeah. accept Israel, but we want to see Israel be a Palestinian majority state, and here's how we'll do it. We want to send millions and millions of Palestinians into Israel to become... Mm -hmm. They have not...